Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back to today's Daf, Bava Basra Daf Nun. We are holding uh, five lines off the top of the Almond. Ha'amar Amemar. Let's just quickly get a refresher. So, yesterday we learned that a husband has no ability to make chazaka on his wife's assets. He's been there three, five, six years. It doesn't indicate anything about his ownership because, first law, firstly, uh, he's entitled to the pay raise. That's part of the marriage arrangement. Number two, even if he wasn't entitled, let's say she, uh, he, he, for, uh, he forfeited that right. Okay? But she's still not going to, you know, be makbid. She's not going to get in his way. He's her husband. So taking in her crops doesn't mean much about his ownership. However, however, if she uh, turned around and sold it to him, so he has a star to prove that he purchased it. In this case, we say, right? She sold him the uh, you know nixe malog, her personal property. Uh, of course, it's a sale; it's a valid deal. Why else would she have given him a star, right? Um, and she can't just say, "Well, you know, uh, I was just trying to you know pacify him. I just wanted to, you know, nachas ruach asisi labali." You don't say that because. Why would she sell him the Nechzei Meluk? Likewise, if the husband went ahead and sold off her property, her Nechzei Meluk, to a stranger, and that stranger knowing that, um, wisely knowing that, um, yeah, right now it's okay because basically the husband is transferring the pay raise entitlement that he has to this buyer, but after you know the husband should pass away, let's say, the wife retrieves her property. So he wants to assure that he keeps the property. So he goes over to the Isha and he backs up the sale. He, he sort of you know, gives her some sort of token amount to pay her off to certify the sale. So we learned yesterday it doesn't work. If it's um, any other field than Nikhse Malug. So if it's the Nikhse Malug, she wouldn't have cooperated for no reason. Unless she actually sells it to him. Unless she actually did it willingly. But otherwise, she would not have done it. And the fact that he has, this, this buyer has a uh, proof of purchase from the husband and then from this wife, we consider it a valid, a valid sale, a valid deal. Ask Stigmar, really? Ha'amar Amemar. But didn't Amemar tell us that it doesn't work? Ish isha, and we assume at this point that it means the ish who sold her property, and then the Isha backed it up, certified the deal as well. So in this sequence, Ish Isha, Shemachur B'Nichsei Miluk, that sold off the Nichsei Miluk properties, it's worthless, it doesn't work. She can, um, uh, you know, claim it back. She can say, Nach Asruach, I was just trying to make him happy, I wasn't really sincere about the deal. And certainly if she would turn around and sell it to him, of course she can claim as such, look, I was just trying to, you know, be nice to my husband, we don't view it, view it as a valid uh, sale. But our mission indicates otherwise. Our mission indicates that if she turned around and sold it to him, it is a valid deal. Answers the Gemara, you're right. I, Maymar, was never speaking about this type of case. Where either, uh, you know, the wife sold it to the husband, or the husband sold it to a stranger, and the wife, you know, seconded that, you know, certified that deal. That's not what he was speaking about. He was speaking about Ish and Isha separately, independently. The Ish sold it, or the Isha sold it, or the Isha sold it. They don't have the power to completely sell this field. Because the, the husband can only sell, at most, the payers that he currently has. He can't sell the actual Guf HaKarka, the property, if he, if he in fact dies before his wife. Because then she's entitled to get it back. He can't sell that. Likewise, she cannot sell the actual property so that if she dies first, the, the, the customer will just keep it. No. Husband has right to take it back, as we're going to see. So that's all Amir was speaking about. He was not speaking about our case at all. 
Kitmar the Amemar says the Gemara. Amemar was discussing a case as follows. Let's say the husband sold this Nichse Maluk property, which doesn't really belong to him, right? Umis, and then he passed away. Okay, so during his lifetime, he can give away the Paris. That's his entitlement. That's his uh, you know, element of ownership. But it's limited to the Paris. But the actual property itself, if he passes away, Umis, guess what? She can come along. Umapka and take it back from this buyer. Inami. Alternatively, if she sold it, Zavna Ihi Umesa and she passed away. Also you. So the husband can come along and get the property back. Umapik. Why? Bitakanta the Rabban. This was established by Takanas Chachamim. He's, he's considered like the first buyer. He has first rights. The husband does. Okay, Rabbi Sirachanina, Dharma Sirachanina, Ba Usha when the Sanhedrin, the great Sanhedrin was in exile in the town of Usha, his skiro they established as follows. So Isha Shamach Rabbi Nichsem Milo gave a wife who sold Nichsem Milo property in, in, during her, his lifetime. Umeisa, she passes away. Don't think the sale sticks. No, Habal Moitzi Miyad Al Kuchetz. We consider it as, as though the husband bought it before this fellow. I think more in, in, in Baba Kama says because um, we're trying to avoid any element of Ava and Amasari, so we gave him that right. That's all Amira was speaking about. He was discussing separate sales. He can't sell independent of her, and she cannot sell independent of him. Avo, but let's say they both join together and sell the same property of Nichsimbalog. Each fellow, uh, each, you know, the Isha or the Isha, right? They're both selling their respective uh, elements of ownership in this property. Let's say they both turn around and sell the property to a stranger. Inami, or alternatively, like in the case of Al Mishnah, she sold it to him. Zavna ili the day. Of course, it works. Zvina, Zvina, Zvini. Okay, so we thought we had a kasha on Ameimar. No, Ameimar was speaking about a different case. The Isha sold independent of the Isha, and the Isha sold independent of the Ish. They they don't have that power. But if they both join together, or if she sells whatever she has to the husband, of course, it works. Another possibility is that Amemar, in fact, was speaking about a case where they both attempted to sell the field to a stranger. But Amemar, the Amak Rebbe unlike our Mishnah, or our Gemara up until this point, held that, um, you know, they, 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 they could. Technically, sell it. Amemar was going with a different sheet, a different opinion. Dama Kerbelazar, it goes like Kerbelazar, who says that unless you have full ownership in an item or a property or an evidence, you cannot um, transfer ownership. You can't sell it. You're not really considered the true owner unless you're fully owning the item. And here you don't have that because Nixon Milog is sort of partially his and partially hers. So each one, even if they join together, they cannot affect any change of ownership. They can't sell it, they can't, right? As we find in a brisa regarding an Eved Kenani, Hamoicher Es Avdei. So we know there's a halacha called Yoim Oyemayim. It's a pasukin, based on a pasukin in Mishpatim. If a fellow strikes his Eved Kenani and he dies, okay, within 24 hours, we attribute it to the attacker and he is held accountable. If it happened later, the attacker, the, the owner, the master is, 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 is absolved, which is something unique to an Eved Kenani. Ordinarily, by a regular person, we say, look, we need to appraise, we need to evaluate whether his uh, situation is deteriorating as a result of the attack, even if it's a week later, a month later. It's not 24-hour related. Whereas by the Eved, we have a din of Yayma Yemayim, which is unique to his owner, to his master. Now, let's say a person was Hamoichar's Avda. He sold the Eved to Shemayin, but he made up with him like this. I want to hold on to him for 30 days. You know, let me... Let me use him for the next 30 I want him to serve me for 30 days. So in these 30 days, what is his status? Who really owns him? Well, Reuben accesses him. He means he uses him. Whereas Shimon is the true owner of the actual item, of the Evan. So Reuben has Kinyan Peroiz, so to speak. He has usage rights. Whereas Shimon has Kinyan Hakuf, the actual person. So we have a four-way Machlegas. Rameo Emer Harishan, Reuben... Who has the Kinyan Peres? Yesh Noy Bedin Yoyma Yemaim. He's considered the true owner with regards to this halacha. You know why? Ipnei Shuutachta because he's serving him. Vasheni, but Shimon, who only owns the actual 
item. He doesn't have this status of true owner because practically he's not really using him. Kasavar, Rameir holds. Kinyan Perez, Kinyan Agovdami, the one who has access to use, the one who has the Kinyan Perez, the usage rights, that's actual ownership. Ruben does, Shimon does not. Rabbi Yudha goes the other way. Rabbi Yudha, Imer Hashemi, Yeshnei Bedin Yemi Yemayim. Shimon is the true owner. You know why? Because he really owns him. Ben Heshu Kaspa, he paid for him, he owns him. Harishan, however, Ruben is not. Einoi Bedin Yemayim, Meshainoi Kaspa. He doesn't really own him anymore. Now Yuda goes with the other approach. Because he holds Kinyan Paris, love Kikinna Gov Dummy. When you have usage rights, that's not actual ownership. Rather, Shimon is the true owner. Rabbi Yisraimer, both aren't considered owners with respect to this halacha. Um, sorry, both are considered owners, and they're both, um, they both are, are entitled to this privilege of Yayimayim. You know why? Because each one of them has an aspect of ownership. Zeh, Reuben has the access, the usage rights. And Shimon has the actual ownership. And Rabbi Yesi is not sure. If Kinyan Peres, whether access to use is considered actual ownership, so he's the real owner. So the other fellow is the owner, therefore we can't really hold anybody accountable with respect to punishments, the suffix nefashas lahokel, and we have a, a, an uncertainty regarding capital punishment, such as in this case, we're not sure who the owner is and who is exempt and who isn't, so we have to go with a lenient approach. Rabbi Lezer, oh, here's the point we're looking for, Rabbi Lezer, Rabbi Lezer, Eimer, guess what, none of them are entitled, none of them are considered true owners. Shneim, einon bedin yoyma yamayim. You know why? Izel, levish ene tachtov. Shimon doesn't have actual access, Vizer and Ruben doesn't have actual ownership. Rabbi adds the source for this halacha. My time at Rabbi Lezer, why is it so? Amakra, the Pasuk, in that halacha tells us, Lo you come, you can't take revenge, you can't um, punish the owner who killed him in this manner, who caused his death. Ki kaspayhu, because he says, possession. Kaspoy who tells you Kaspoy ham yuchad It has to be his personal possession. It can't be sort of a, a shared asset, such as in this case where it's partially owned by him and partially by him. Likewise, says the Gemara, in the case of the Nichsem, look, that's what, that was the purpose of this whole discussion. We're trying to draw that concept over here as well. Apply it to our sugi of Nichsem, look, who owns it? Well, we're not really sure. According to Belazar, nobody really owns it. Because the, the husband owns the pay race, the wife owns the guf of the karka. So they're both not really full owners. It's not exclusively either one of theirs. So uh, none of them could sell it. Right? It's like selling something that doesn't belong to you, right? Because you're only a part owner. Uh, and therefore, you don't have the ability to, uh, to uh, affect any sale on this whatsoever. And that's what Amemar was speaking of. When Amemar says a husband and wife who, shared, who joined together and sold next time, look, it doesn't work. That's because it was going to a blazer shita. None of them are really true owners. But our Mishnah, which indicates otherwise, our Mishnah, which indicates that a husband can, can purchase the property from his wife, indicating that she can unload whatever she has in this property, she can affect the sale and a transfer of ownership, that's going like a different sheet. Okay. So that's going like the... Um, like, you know, like the Chachamim, the other opinions in this price, who uh, disagree with Rabbi Lazar. Okay, so the mission says, If a husband uh, attempts to make a Chazok on his wife's asset, it doesn't work. Right? As we explained before. Because she's not expected to protest against him, whether it's because he's entitled to take the pay raise. Or whether it's because, you know, she's not going to make a ruckus about her husband eating, you know. Really? Really? Says the Gemara. Vama Rav. But Rav tells us, Aishas Ish, even a married woman, she's meant to yell and scream. She's meant to make a mecha. She should protest. If anybody attempts 
to take over her properties. Now, the man, who is she protesting against? Who is this uh, villain? Is it a stranger? In that case, actually, you don't expect her to step in because she can just rely on her husband to take you know, her case and you know, to pursue it for her. Vama Rav, Rav himself, so this is statement two of Rav, he says, Ein You can never make a chazaka on a married woman's property because she could just say, I relied on my husband to take care of it for me. I thought he would chase him away. I, that's why you know, I didn't get involved. And here, Rav, in the first statement, tells us, Anish Ish is expected to make him a chah. These two statements don't seem to reconcile. They don't seem to jive. Elul Oh, apparently, when Rav says, Anish Ish is expected to make him a chah, not on a stranger. Over there, she's relying on the husband. We're not expecting her to step in. But we're speaking that the, that, that the husband himself is assuming ownership on her property. Now, she's expected... To, to make a machah. Right? Okay, so now, how does that work with our Mishnah, which says that a husband never has the ability to affect chazak on his wife's properties? Yeah, our Mishnah is speaking a Rav in the first statement who says, Eishishish, Tzrich is going on the husband, against the husband. Why would she be expected to make a machah on the husband? We're not speaking about a conventional husband who's doing conventional things. She notices this husband of hers. Not only is he taking the papers, but he's destroying her property. He has his bobcat and he's digging away pits and holes. Of course she should get in his way. And if she keeps quiet, that is a true chazaka. Which indicates that it's really his. Asks the Gemara, really? So when a person harms, when a person damages property, he can make a chazaka? That is a show of ownership? V'amar Nachman, didn't Rav Nachman tell us, Amar Rabba Barabu, the name of Rabba, ain't chazaka le nezaka. No. A, a true owner does not destroy property. If you're destroying property, apparently you're not really the owner. You're just, you know, cutting and running. Right? Ema, let's revise it. Ain't din chazaka le nezaka. He meant the other way around. You know, typically, chazaka takes three years. But if he's destroying the property, you don't have to wait three years to show ownership. Meaning, as soon as he starts doing this, he has an instant chazaka. Nobody in his right mind will allow a person to damage his property. So typically you say it takes him three years till he wakes up, till he gets around to, you know, confronting this fellow. But if he's destroying his property, he should be protesting on the moment. So here we say that the chazaka is effective immediately. Okay, so back to our halacha. We're speaking that a husband who was destroying, was, was damaging the wife's property, she should get in his way. Otherwise, he can claim ownership. Ivo is saying another possibility, another way of to explain. When Rav Nachman said, Ein chazaka until now we thought he was speaking about the, you know, the chazaka that we speak about in this parak, cheskas abatim, the, the cheskas ra'aya. Being there, you know, a number of years to show ownership. No, 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 he wasn't speaking about that. He was speaking about something called cheskas tashmishin. So you have two neighbors, right? And one fellow is engaged in some sort of practice which inconveniences his, his neighbor or harms his neighbor. He's been doing it for a while and the neighbor hasn't said anything. That establishes cheskas tashmishin. He can just stay on with it. He can say, look, if you would have gotten in my way if you would have said something fine but you, you were okay with it your silence is interpreted as concession as cooperation okay so if Nachman says but you should know that only works when it's just you know a matter of inconveniencing or you know trespassing or whatever but if it's actually harming him being mazakim you can't do you can't you can't make a chazaka like that against your neighbor Haven't we learned the, the pshat on, the, on Rav Nachman's statement that was speaking about a fellow who was attempting to make cheskas tashmishin, to establish like sort of usage rights against his neighbor. Rav Mori Omar Bakutra, Rav Mori says, for instance, was speaking that he's 
uh, creating some sort of smoke uh, situation, smoking into his friend's neighborhood. Rabbi Zvid Amar Beis Akise is established a Beis Akise there, which is uh, generating some uh, some unpleasant uh, odors in his friend's uh, uh, property. So in these situations, even if he's been there for a while without protest, it doesn't mean anything because you know the neighbor can say, "Look, I figured I can handle it, but now I can't." That's all he was talking about. So there's no immediate. A claim of Cheska Sashmishin. But back to our story of Chazaka, of Raya, of Gimel Shonim, it's a totally different concept. A person was Machzik in a Sade for three years, and you know he claims ownership, and in that case we say, if you're damaging the property, the owner should have gotten up and yelled at you. And if he didn't, you have immediate, instant Chazaka. And if the husband sh- should do this to his wife's property, she should be Meicha as well. And otherwise, he can claim ownership. Rav Yosef Amma. So that was the, you know, the first way to explain Rav. Rav who says that an Ish Ish has to be Meicha. Typically not, but if he's, if he's being Mazak or property, she should be Meicha. Rav Yosef Amma, Leila Ba'acha. No, perhaps Rav can be speaking about a case where there's a stranger. Um, uh, attempting to claim ownership on her property. All right, so let's say it's the husband... Perhaps in all situations, she's not expected to get it, to go up against him. And therefore, he has no chazok. We're speaking about a stranger. Now, why would, she, why would the married woman be expected to make a machor? I mean, she can just say, I'm relying on my, on my husband, right? As per Rav's second statement. The answer is like this. Okay, going, we're speaking about a case. This stranger arrived on this property during her husband's lifetime. He was there for, you know, part of the three year, a year, let's say, right? Then the husband passes away and he stays on for, for another three years. So now she better get in his way because he has a migu. He can claim ownership based on the following argument. He can say, look, migu di bi amar. Lo. Or ano. Zavinta minach. Since he can just turn around and say, look, I bought it from you, the, the widow. Forget about what happened during your husband. I'm here three years, I bought it from you. He could have said that. If he was to lie, he can say that. Ki lo nami at zavin So therefore, even if he'll acquiesce, he'll agree that it didn't, it didn't really happen that way. Rather, you sold it to your husband. V'zavin and Aliyah turned around and sold it to me. Way back when, Mehmed. You gotta believe, you gotta trust him. So in this type of situation, of course, she, she's better, she better wake up. She better make a chazak, a macha, before he gets three years in after her husband's passing. Okay, so in summary, the Mishnah says, typically a husband cannot generate chazak on his wife's assets. She's not going to, you know. The question is, Rav made a statement which says, Eishas ish, tzricha limchais. She is expected to make a macha. We have two possible ways to explain it. Either against the husband who is destroying the property. In this case, she better make a macha, otherwise he can claim ownership, because why would she just let him do that? Or we're speaking about a stranger, who started off during his lifetime, but it's been three years afterwards. So Migo, that he can just say, I bought it from you, he can then be trusted by saying, look, I got it from the husband who got it from you, Mrs. Uh, so she better make a macha. Gufa, let's go back to Amarav, Ein machzikim ish. Typically, you can make a, a, a chazaka on a married woman's property, because she can just say, I'm relying on my husband, he runs the business, and, you know, but we have a machlekes. V'dayone goyla. This is a term referring to Shmuel and Karna. Okay, so these Amaraim disagreed. Amru machzik, and they said, look, even Aishas Ish is expected to make a macho, and if one is in possession of her properties for three years, he's, he's, uh, he has a chazaka. Amar Rav, Rav Paskins, halacha, k'dayone goyla. I go like them. That an Aishas Ish is expected to Wage a protest, otherwise it generates chazaka. Whoa! Amr le Rav Kahana Ravasi. They turned the Rav and they said, Hadabe mar mishmaite. Do you mean you, you're, you're going back on your, on your word? You, uh, you were the one who said, Ish, ish um, is not susceptible to chazaka. Amr Luz, he told them, I, I stick to my opinion. Mistavra Amr Rav Yosef. I'm assuming that Dayane Gala would never in disagreement with me to begin with. When they said that Nesha's Ish 
must make a mecha'a. He was speaking about the case that we had before from Rav Yosef. Now, obviously, Rav was not relating to Rav Yosef, as Rajbam explains. Rav lived many years before Rav Yosef. The case of Rav, the, the, the scenario that Rav Yosef presents, where the fellow was there three years after her husband's passing, in this case, of course, he has a valid claim, and she must make a chazaka. That's what Rav meant when he said, halacha kadayana goyla, in that case only. Okay, all the best to you, Hatzlacha Rabbah.